So proof of value or imbalance in supply and demand. So yeah, again, so Japanese candlesticks and what we look at is the daily and the weekly time frame and the daily really because um, if you think about the amount of supply or demand, you know, in a day that it takes to, you know, to move the market, um, it just makes sense for, you know, the higher time frames to be, uh, to look at for the stronger, strongest, to be the strongest areas of supply and demand. Daily time frame traders won't really look at the lower time frames, but lower time frame traders will look at the daily time frames whether they trade them or not, but they definitely still look at them. So um, you've got more eyeballs on something like the daily time frame chart than you would, nah, maybe I can't really quantify it, but just my understanding of it is that you would have, um, you know, it's more significant than, for example, a 10 minute supply zone or a 15 minute supply zone. But again, at the 15 minute, you could have had a, um, a, a news event, you know, some sentiment event, and that would probably obviously coincide with you know the daily time frame at the end of the day but generally i'm looking at daily and weekly time frames and the reason the reason the more significant is because if you if you've got a huge amount of money to to um, to to shift or transact you, you have to have you have to be looking at the high time frames because it yeah. takes longer for you to actually do the transaction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got the you know you got you got a bit by bit iceberg orders etc. You know, so um, it makes sense to uh, look at the daily and the weekly time frame. So, um, oh, do you know what? Have I deleted a slide? Oh my lord! I think I've deleted a slide. Basically, um, I want to go on to uh, basically how to draw supply and demand zones. So, uh, da, 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 create a new board and how I draw supply and demand zones. And this is just basically, it's not like a, um, a, a set in stone rule and you know, the right or the wrong way. This is just how I've, you know, determined, um, where I would draw supply and demand, um, supply and demand zones. And, you know, we know that higher highs, higher lows. So what you would have is you would have a move up, for example, something like that and then you would get pullback at some point a negative candle and then you'll get a new candle or a sequence of candles that actually make a new high now the new high can be either a close above this what would what would have been considered potential expensive areas so if we're looking at uh this being a move up, pull back, all right? And so this is considered a potential expensive area until proven otherwise, right? And then what I would look for is a close or a candle wick above. Now, it obviously depends on how deep the pullback is as well, but what I'm looking for at you know, at this point to draw my demand zone would be bullish candles, a bearish candle, and the last bearish candle before prices start to make a new high. So that would be where I would draw my demand zone from. And that would be where the demand zone is. So it's the last bearish candle that would represent for example a pullback lower high um sorry the higher low before prices make a new high so in you know prices have to obviously make the new high to prove that this is going to be a higher low and once it does then that's my demand zone is that okay everyone follow along yeah i got it yeah it might all right brilliant and with supply, it would be the same thing, just in reverse. And we're looking for a pullback at some point. Oh, apologies, I should change that to green. And I'll show you obviously on the price chart as well. Uh, what's going on? What am I doing? Filled that one. 
green. There we go. And then we're looking for proof and lower lows like that. And then this would be the supply zone because this is the lower high and lower low. So you've got move down, move up. And as soon as you create that lower low, this then becomes the supply zone right here. Yep. You're not talking about major zones at this point though, are you just a, yeah, it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just um, how I identify uh, supply and demand zones on a price chart. Okay. On a candlestick price chart. So this is basically what I'm looking for. And major zones, um, I'm going to show you definitely on a, on, a, on a price chart in a sec. Okay. Um, everyone are still okay with this? Yeah. All right. I'll take the silences. I'll continue to. Yeah, mate. Yes. Yeah, no worries. So what makes a good supply or demand zone? So this is basically, um, you know, things like key levels. Um, so you've got basically how price enters and leaves. So what I want to see is something along the lines of this. I want to see like a hard in and hard out price movement. So this was a trade um, that I took. And if we're looking at this here, look at this price. You've got price hard in, and then you've got that kind of hard out price movement. That for me, I love this, this type of price movement. It's this as well, you've got hard in, hard out. Um, again, you've got this move up and then move down. This is what I like to see. I don't like to see prices necessarily, um, stick around for too long, but this is okay. All right. I prefer this, this, this is still decent. All right. So it proves to me that, um, you know, the, the, the way that price left there were definitely strong buyers. If prices tend to be a bit like, uh, I'll do another one. If prices tend to do something like this and they go into a level, or well, then they just kind of just meander <laughs> around. I, I like to see strong supply. If I'm looking at that, if I'm looking, I like to see strong demand. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. Um, not necessarily, um, you know, long basing and then, and then an imbalance. I'm looking for hard in and then hard out. Um, also I'm looking for distance traveled. So, I mean, that just, uh, makes some sense because what you want to see, um, is really again, proof of, of, um, of demand or proof of supply. So if you have a move like that, and it goes, into a level, is that strong supply? Nope. Is that strong supply? Nope. So the further away it goes from the level is the stronger this area of supply or for example, demand is something like this just isn't a strong level of supply until proven. Otherwise we just need to look for that, you know, proof of value. So distance traveled, preferably if it does take out levels of supply or demand. So what I mean by that is, let's say, for example, you've got level of demand here. So we know that from a technical perspective, this is a cheap area. Now, if we see a supply zone, a supply, oh, a supply prices come in and take out this level of what would be considered cheap area, I know this now is a strong area of supply. Just look at the distance that it has traveled and also the fact that it's taken out a previous cheap level. So it's, you know, something has shifted in what would have been considered a bargain 
maybe, you know, a week or two ago. So now this becomes the area to look for short trades because as long as fundamentals are on your side, this is where you'll be looking. And, and that's all based on, on the banks. Uh, uh, that's exactly it because they're the ones that are moving price. And what do they, and they look at, you know, fundamentals. And so, so should we. So if we're on the right side fundamentally, then a trade like this makes sense. Like, you know, for example, Europe, Italy going into recession, uh, Brexit, you know, the uncertainty around Brexit, you've got, um, you know, the US, which is, you know, the best economy, regardless of what you think about, you know, Donald Trump politically, um, GDP wise, you know, they're head and shoulders above above what's going on in Europe. You know, they've got they had inflation at the time, etc. So it just made sense as far as the dollar being the one to buy, you know, the 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 the, the currency to buy over the euro. Because I because I know what I know, but um, if fundamentals are in play, then this has to be bargain area. It was proven to be a bargain area right here. And if nothing's changed, then this should be a bargain again in the future. So your bias on this then is basically to always go short. So you're looking yep. for that price to come back and then. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. 100%. I've got my fundamental bias and then all I'm looking for is supply zones. And that's all I've really been doing um, this year or last year as well. It's just literally shorting, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the, the, the euro dollar. For me, there was really no reason to buy. There are times where, you know, the euro will have some positive sentiment and the, the dollar will have some negative sentiment. But if, you know, we're always keeping our eye on the fundamentals and the uh, Trading economics. I don't know. If, um, I'm sure Mark's, uh, you know, showed you about this this website um, indicators. If you go to countries, if you go to any country, so for example, United States, and you look at, for example, the GDP growth rate, two point two. Let's go to the euro area, zero point two. Mm. When we look at Things yeah, like, you know, when we look at uh, United States dollar, um, um, what we're looking at, inflation rate. So 1.9, euro area, 1.4. Remember that the central banks have a 2% target. So whoever's closest to the 2% target wins. And especially if you're above that 2% target, because what happens is, is that central banks will have to raise interest rates in order to, um, you know, stem inflation, stop it from getting out of hand. All right. So raising interest rates, as you know, is positive for a currency because you get, you know, bigger returns. And if, for example, your, your interest rate, the euro interest rate is zero and the dollar is at 2.5 it's pretty much a no-brainer which one you should be buying or which one you should be selling especially when you think about all right there was there was uh donald trump's trade war with china and uh again that can cause some negative sentiment so what we do is or what i do is i keep an eye on the numbers but overall i still should be buying the dollar if you know the the, the sentiment hasn't produced anything uh numbers wise if the tr if the chinese trade war between donald trump isn't affecting or the numbers aren't coming out as negative right every time then it's just sentiment it's just words until it's proven in the data then that's when i might start to look to kind of change my mind but as long as the numbers are the numbers 
you know, prices, I look for value. And, and a lot of people, I was saying this to a trader the other day, is that everyone's so driven by price. You know, everybody can see what price is on a price chart, but not everybody can see value. So prices can go in a certain direction, but that just, you know, again, that could just be short-term sentiment, negative sentiment. And I'm not going to be right all the time, but overall, I'm going to be, you know, right more than I'm, more than I'm wrong, hopefully. <laughs> you know, so, um, which, well, actually I am, but um, it's just about shorting this until, uh, you know, until, until really the numbers, the numbers change. Make sense? Yeah, my mind's blown away with that. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Yeah, so fundamentals, um, you know, uh, the first, I think the first, do you remember, Mark, I think the first ever uh, um, meeting I ever had with you, <laughs> you showed me fundamentals and I didn't listen to it until maybe about a good, maybe a year later, a year, year and a half. And even then it took me a while to kind of, uh, to grasp everything. I was so I was so caught up on the technicals. Yeah, it's yeah, it's natural, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> you know, but the fundamentals are are what is what what is really in play. 